Welcome to Shook Coverlet, where we squeeze the bigger picture of literature. I'm Adrian Ford, and we are here for the weekly reader number nine. I am a little bit perturbed, a little bit angry, and I'm probably going to be a little bit more animated in this episode than uh, what is perhaps normal on this series. And partially due to that, I'm going to start this episode a little bit differently than most episodes. We're going to start with the poem and we are going to work our way backwards into a myriad of definitions, definitions about which there is something in common, something which is um, angering me at the moment. And um, you'll recognize what it is. And I think um, the discussion is going to lead in that direction and what is next from that. So the poem is, unsurprisingly, from Emily Dickinson. Uh, it comes to us from page 490, poem number 1082 in This Bad Boy, The Complete Poems of Emily Dickinson. Revolution is the pod systems rattle from. When the winds of will are stirred, excellent is bloom. But except its russet base, every summer be the entomber of itself, so of liberty. Left inactive on the stalk, all its purple fled. Revolution shakes it for test if it be dead. Um, I want to go straight from there to a definition in a dictionary of literary and thematic terms by Edward Quinn. This definition comes to us from page 75. It is the definition of Dada. And it reads as such. Dada. A movement of writers and artists that rejected conventional modes of art and thought in favor of consciously cultivated, deliberate nonsense. According to its founder, Tristan Zara, Dada means nothing. Nothing in this context. Standing for the principle of the gratuitous, irrational, unconditioned element in life is the true source of freedom and creativity. The movement began in Zurich in 1916. The name Dada, it means hobby horse, selected randomly from the dictionary. It flourished until 1923, attracting among its adherents the sculptor Hans Arp, the artist Man Ray and Marcel, the artists Man Ray and Marcel Ducamp, the composer Eric Sadie and writers Jean Cocteau, Louis Argon, Argon and Andre Breton. Breton was led to break with Dada. Breton was to lead the break with Dada that resulted in the formation of surrealism in 1924. The next definition is new criticism, which or is um no the Harlem Renaissance, which happens on page 145. Um, and some of these will be abbreviated definitions just so we get through them. This is the opening paragraph from the term. The term for flowering of African-American literature, music, and dance that took place in the 1920s in New York's Harlem District. In the, in the wake of World War I, a half century after the abolition of slavery, many black intellectuals and artists perceived that the time had come for the final emancipation of African-Americans the recognition of their right to equal status in America's social and cultural life. The next definition is new criticism, which comes on 216. This again, simply the opening paragraph from the definition. New criticism, a type of Anglo-American criticism that, that arose in the 1920s and 1930s and became the dominant form of academic criticism until well into the 1960s. The basic principle of new criticism was to locate the meaning of a literary work not in the intention of the author, nor in the experience of the reader, but in, quote, the text itself, end quote. The internal relation of the language to the co uh, that constitute a poem, the new critics tend to employ the term poem to describe any type of literature, perhaps a reflection of their greater success in analyzing poems than fiction or drama. The reader gained critical understanding through a process of close reading, strict attention to the characteristics of literary work and conveyed by such elements as irony, paradox, tension, imagery, and symbol. 
Among the errors to be avoided were the intentional fallacy, the attempt to locate meaning in the author's intention, and the effective fallacy, an attempt to search for meaning in the experience of the reader. This would have been an extremely um, revolutionary way to look at literature. It doesn't matter what the artist intends. It is what is in the text itself. It doesn't matter what the reader experiences. What is in the text itself? The next definition is Russian formalism, which comes on page 289. A school of criticism that flourished in Russia from about 1915 to 1932. The formalists concentrated on determining the distinction between language as it is used in literature and the ordinary use of language. They approached their analysis with scientific rigor, freed from what they regarded as the emotional exercises of symbolism and futurism. Among their practitioners were the distinguished linguist Roman Jacobson and Vladimir Propp a prominent analyst of folk literature. Um, the, critical, the two critical terms introduced by the formalists are still employed today. Defamiliarization, a, the disruption of the reader's usual ex expectations, and foregrounding, the use of language that calls attention to itself. The movement came to an end in 1932 when socialist realism was installed as the official critical doctrine of the Soviet Union. Uh, the death of an idea there. How interesting. The next definition is surrealism, which comes to us from page 315 and reads as such. This is, again, simply the opening paragraph of the definition. Surrealism, an artistic and literary movement that stressed the importance of the unconscious in artistic creativity. The unconscious in artistic creativity. The French poet and critic André Breton Breton, Breton, I don't know how, I've never heard of this individual, but it is, he was apparently extremely influential. The French poet founded the movement in 1924 after breaking away from Dada, another highly experimental avant-garde development. Breton defined surrealism as pure psychic automatism by means of which we propose to express either verbally or in writing or in some other fashion what really goes on in the mind dictation by the mind unhampered by conscious control and having no aesthetic or moral goals having no aesthetic or moral goals out of this program the surrealist developed this series of principles that stress the importance of dreams the underlying logic of apparent contradictions the suspect character of abstract ideals which such as those that led to World War I, and the importance of the Freudian id as the source of creativity for the reader as well as the writer. And the final definition will be theater of cruelty, which is on page 322 here, just the opening paragraph. Theater of cruelty, a theory of theatrical performance designed to return theater to its primitive ritualistic origins. The phrase was coined in the 1920s by the French dramatist Antonin Artaud. Artaud. Artaud called for a theater that would liberate its audience from the repressive character of modern society. The theater not tied to a script, but one in which, the sponta in which spontaneous improvisation would be the dominant mode of presentation. Did you notice anything in common with those definitions? All of them honored the years 1915-ish to 1935-ish. Um, this would have this was an incredibly revolutionary time period for art. Um, in fact, just looking at my bookcase here f scott fitzgerald the harlem renaissance uh, most of the stories in american short stories uh, ernest hemingway all of these different things from the 19 uh, trench poets all of these things and what do we have today what do we have even cyberpunk 
is noted as from the 1980s, steampunk 1980s, but probably before, owing to its inception, Jules Verne. Um, what do we have? What do we have, fucking mumble rap? We don't have anything. There's nothing going on. I'll tell you what we've got. I'll tell you what's going on. There is a definition in here for what we have today, and it comes on page 259. Let me get there. 259. Problematic. In contemporary theory, a term used as a noun to designate a group of related ideas that represents one aspect or subset of an ideology. Identifying a work's problematic enables a reader to recognize its limitations as well as its strengths. This is what we have today. This is the movement of today, and it's, we're not even doing it right. We're not even doing it right. Identifying a work's problematic enables a reader to recognize its limitations as well as its strengths. Um, in today's world, problematic is simply means to cancel, means to, I don't really have to know that work, it's problematic. Problematica, automatica, doesn't matter. Um, so where do we go? What do we do? What are we doing here? What are we? What's going on? It's hard to say. Um, there's not a whole lot <laughs> that I can recognize in today's world that is. Uh, I mean, th think about it. Think about it. Even, I mean, cyberpunk, something that's getting a little bit of a resurrection in the uh, popular society in the in the pop consciousness. This comes from the '80s. That's 30, 40 years ago. That's ancient. That is ancient. That is the difference between um, the 20s and the 60s. That is the difference between um, the, basically it's the difference between the Civil War and World War I. And think about the differences between art between those time periods. But something like cyberpunk, something like steampunk is still very accepted, still very cutting edge today because we're not moving forward with our artistic movements. Um, so artistic movements, the artistic movements that we mentioned, uh, these are artistic movements with philosophy and intellectualism at their core, which is a very interesting thing to think about. Uh, and if you think about it metaphorically, what's going on there, think of it, you've got the metaphor, you've got the philosophy or the um, intellectual, the intellectual mechanism of the artistic movement at its center, like a seed, like the seed of an orange, like the seed of an apple. On the outside of that orange, of that apple, the outside of an orange is the rind. It is bright orange in order that it catches the eye. The outside of an apple is bright red that it might catch the eye. Um, those, so if it is the intellectualism, if it is the philosophy which is at the core, and it is what we're doing metaphorically is looking at the orange with the seeds in the middle, the orange rinds that are supposed to catch the eye, that's the language of writing. That is, those are the colors of a painting. Those are the rhythms of music. But the meat of the matter, which is the communication of that philosophy, which is meant to wriggle its way into the reader's mind, which is meant to wriggle its way into the consumer of that art. That's the meaty part of the fruit. It's the good part. It's the part where it's all fibrous. Fibrous so that we're going to get to the center. We're going to eat those seeds, digest them, so that they can be deposited and um, basically populate the next generation. That is, that is the artistic metaphor that I'm going for here. That is the artistic metaphor that I'm going with here. Um, the... Dada, the central, um, the central idea there is that is of nothingness. 
it means nothing, does Dada. So the outside of, we'll go with surrealism. We'll go, I can't even do that. All, all of these conceits, all of these central conceits are demonstrated by their artists. Uh, you think Dali with surrealism. Looking at that painting, that is the bright orange rind. So the meat of what's actually going on in the painting, the meat of what's actually going on in the painting is to convince you of the surrealistic take, is to convince you that you can intuit something from that painting by the feeling it gives you, because the feeling it gives you is tapping away at the id in your lizard brain. So that's how that works. We are digesting, we are digesting a philosophy when we consume art. A philosophy is a way of thinking. Not a message, but a way of thinking. When we are digesting a message from an artist, again, that goes back to um, propaganda, which we've discussed in, I believe, several different episodes of The Weekly Reader. But when you're digesting a philosophy, it is simply a way of looking at the world. You're not given the answers. You're given the tools. No one's taking you to the back of the math book. We're just telling you what the division sign means when you're reading a piece. That's what, that's what the act of consuming art is. It's learning what the division sign means. It's learning PEMDAS. It's learning all of these things that allow you to do the math in the book. And in fact, a lot of the answers at the back of the book are sort of arbitrary. Um, and I hate when people use arbitrary in an argument because it normally means you don't know what you're talking about. But in this case, I kind of mean it. I kind of mean that all of the answers in the back of the book are arbitrary because what you're doing is you are simply throwing around more tools and more tools and more tools. That's how you get to the back of the book. Um, so where do we go from here? What is the big artistic movement of the day? What should it be? I don't know. If there are any writers watching this, if there are any critics watching this, um, I would love to know the philosophies by which you write, the philosophies by which you criticize, the microscopes under which you place the art that you consume. The only thing I can really do is explain the two ideas that I keep going back to. And you've heard them on this channel, both of them, a handful of times. One comes from Jacques Derrida. It is the idea of hauntology. Um, and I'm getting this as a quote from the Wikipedia article. As a philosophical concept, it refers to the return or persistence of elements from the past, as in the manner of ghosts. One of the phrases that is often thrown around when referencing hauntology is that the future has been canceled. So, if we are here just representing and re-representing and digesting and repassing ideas that have already come through, ideas that have already come to pass, artistic movements which have already grown and died, fashions which have gone out of fashion three decades ago. If all we're doing is repurposing the past, let's own it. Um, let's accept timelessness as a fault. I think that that is an interesting concept to explore. I think that hauntology is one of these things that is almost undeniable. 
when you start looking at the artistic movements that have been around for 30 years or more now, what is the last, I mean, the last really massive artistic innovation that I can think of outside of simply capturing the world as it is, which is photography, which is videography, which allowed um, painters to sort of divorce themselves from um, having to represent life as it is and be able to represent life as they see it. Um, the last real artistic revolution I can think of that's really still alive is hip hop and rap. Those were artistic movements uh, that are rooted in 70s and 80s, but are still evolving um, in massive, massive ways. Outside of that, I mean, literature, I can't really think of anything that doesn't hearken to some voice that's already come to pass. I can't think of any. I mean, <sighs> Burnt Tongue, uh, if you look that up, or uh, Dangerous Writing, Scared Writing, or I always mess this up. I can't remember if it's Scared Writing or Dangerous Writing. I think it's Dangerous Writing. Um, is a term that comes from, um, what is his name again? I'm forgetting everything this morning. Where am I? Tom Spanbauer. Look up Tom Spanbauer. But this is an idea that I think is incredibly um, interesting. Disorienting your reader via time. Using time to sort of play with your reader's mind. And what are the assumptions that a reader comes to based on certain things in your writing. For example, if no one has a cell phone, what is your reader going to assume? If no one has, if everyone's using a phone that's on a wall, where does that peg your reader? If everyone is riding a horse? I mean, think about it. Um, Ernest Hemingway, born in 1899, would have lived a a good portion of his life not seeing automobiles. I mean, when did automobiles become ubiquitous and ubiquitous where he was living? Um, and this is a voice that shapes our literature today. What about William Faulkner? There is a great scene in As I Lay Dying where someone has a car as an automobile. The other idea to which I keep coming uh, is nihilism. As told by Dmitry Pisarev, it is a quote that you have heard on this channel on many more than one occasions, but it is as such, and I think it can be helpful to a writer. I think it could be seminal to an artistic movement. Here is the ultimatum of our camp. What can be smashed must be smashed. Whatever will withstand the blow is sound. What flies into smithereens is rubbish. At any rate, strike out right and strike out left. No harm will or can come of it. Uh, these two ideas contrast very heavily. Ontology is recycling the ideas from the past. Nihilism in this sense is uh, doing away with the past if it doesn't work, but keeping what will work. But what does it mean to work, especially in an artistic sense? I think this is where Jordan Peterson is doing much more work than is necessary when he is um, shaming the nihilists so often as he uh, sort of discredits the movement of nihilism does not take into account the full breadth of nihilism simply takes into account basically the post-world war one strain of nihilism not this seminal russian 1880s nihilism uh, but when, when you're looking at that why do we refer to things in literature by how, how we refer to them? Why do we start stories with a description? Why do we start stories with a setting? 
what does it mean if we never give a setting in a story? Where is it that this story is happening in your reader's mind? Can you pull that off? Can you pull off a story without a setting, without giving a setting? Can you make that real in your reader's mind? And if you can, where are they imagining that story taking place? And what does that say about the reader? I think that these are all things that can... I think these are both ideas which can lead to fruitful if we're returning to that metaphor, writing, we turn to fruitful criticism and really sort of help make something new versus just recycling. Even if, ironically, one of these ideas is about recycling ideas from the past. But that is all that I have this week on The Weekly Reader. Hopefully this made some type of sense. Hopefully... Uh, someone else is as kicked in the ass as I am about this revelation that everything, uh, we, we, we have no revolutions in art, we have no revolutions in ideas. Uh, even when you look at the philosophers of our day, Sam Harris, he's talking about free will, he's talking about religion, he's talking about things that are recycled, he's talking about things of epochs past. Uh, but again, I hope to see you back next week for uh, another weekly reader as well as the fact that we've got The Shining still going on the channel. Uh, we, are, we have moved on to An Enemy of the People by Henrik Ibsen. Um, and we're going to have short stories and poems on a weekly basis as well, as well as the fact that I am getting around to a review um, on Absalom. Absalom, I'm trying to figure, I'm trying to figure it out. I really am. That that book kicked me in the ass. I'm trying to figure out why. And if I can figure out why, I can maybe do something interesting with the review. I thought I had it figured out where I would be going. I don't. I don't. 